So you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to uh, the book of Malachi. We've been looking at a number of thoughts over these past uh, number of weeks. And uh, I say Malachi, was, was, his name was Messenger. So he was coming to tell and he was coming to talk about the things of God. And he was coming to warn the people. And he was coming to speak to the people about where they stood before God. And there was a number of problems. There was a number of situations. There was a number of things that were, were, were wrong. And he was dealing with them in, in a very systematic way as he went through this wonderful book. 
as I said, the, the church as we looked in Revelation there, uh, it, was, it was lukewarm. It was neither cold nor hot. So he said, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased in goods and of need of nothing. And sometimes in the church we can say, listen, I am rich, increased in goods, of need of nothing. But yet the Bible says, no, thou knowest not that thou art miserable and poor and blind and naked. And, and the reality here was that the people were backslidden, the people were worldly, and the, the, the nation had gone far away from God. And sometimes we can see that in our own land and in our own word. And sometimes we can see it as we bring it personally to our own hearts and to our own lives in the particular situation. The first thing we looked at was, was chapter 1 and verse 2. He says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein is that as thou love me? There was a doubted love. They doubted whether God loved them. And yet God clearly in this portion says, I have loved you. That's why he spoke to Peter, and we looked at that little thought, didn't we, the first week, uh, where he said to Peter, lovest thou me? Do you really love me? And that's the great question to us, do we really love him? Do we love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength? The second little thought we looked at there in, in verse 7 was that there was a defiled honor. It said, ye offered polluted bread upon mine altar. And what they did was they were to bring sacrifices to God. But instead of bringing their very best, they, they brought what they had, the animal that was lame, the, the, the animal that was defiled, the animal that wasn't pure, they brought that to God. So they offered defiled sacrifices on the altar to God. And that wasn't what God was, was asking for. So in other words, we looked at the little thought. They, they brought what was half-hearted to God. They didn't bring their very best. But they brought and they said, listen, this will do. That's not what we do to God. We bring our very best to him. We give of our best. Not just a partial obedience, but there's a full obedience to God. They despise the very privilege of being priests. Uh, they were to uphold the law of God. They were to uphold the law to the people. And they weren't faithful in preaching to the people or telling the people or expecting the people. And that's whenever, whatever we're involved in, whatever we're doing for God, we have to be faithful in what we're doing it. We have to be faithful in the standards we set. We have to be faithful to the word of God and preach the fullness of the word of God. And they turned away from God's law. And sadly, the priest had turned away from it and the people had turned away from it. And what we were looking at there was just that the that we are to be a people who keep the law of God, who endeavor to keep the word of God in our hearts and in our lives. And that will have an impact upon the people who are outside. Last week, we looked at the little thought of a despised table uh, there in, in chapter uh, 1 and verse 7. Uh, was it says, ye have polluted bread upon my altar. Well, where, he, where have we polluted thee? The table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, the sacrifices that they gave to God weren't good. They didn't challenge their own hearts, their own lives, their own experience. And we, we it was our communion Sunday last week, and we, we looked about coming faithfully before the Lord. And we looked about the, that little thought, let a man examine himself, and that a man was to come worthily before his God when he came to the Lord's table. So the little challenges were uh, that we, we had the, the look back as we come to the Lord's table, we think of Calvary. And before we come to the Lord's table, we realize, well, what Calvary means to us. Then we look ahead. We look forward to his coming. This do in remembrance of me until I come. Then we, we, we had the, the, the look within, a worthy manner. And folks, these were all the thoughts we brought. And then there was the, the look around to see fellowship one with another around the Lord's table. And these things weren't going on. These things were despised. And these things were left to one side. And Malachi was the messenger that God had sent to bring that message to the people. Can I say we're moving on the, this morning to chapter 2 and verse 17. And that's why we went into the end of chapter 2. Because there was a degraded moral standard. And it says here in the first portion, it says, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have you wearied him? When we say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. 
and he did, and he delighted in them. Or where is the God of judgment? Everyone that doeth evil is good. You know that that a completely wrong moral standard. What they were saying here, listen, those who were doing evil are prospering. So they're being treated nearly as if they're doing what is right. And those who are doing good are, are under the cosh. Those who are doing good are under the hammer. Those who are doing good are, are beneath and below. Why do the evil prosper? And why are the good put down? And why are the good always on the back foot? And when they looked at, the stand, at what was happening in their own lives and in their own heart and in their own situations, they were saying, look, good is looked upon as evil. And evil is looked upon as good. But can I say, first of all, one part I want to look at. It says, ye have wearied the Lord. And you know, when, when, when we turn around the moral standards of life, and when we look upon evil as good, we weary God. We weary God. And you know, God, God is not easily wearied. But I'm sure he's wearied by some of the things we do. And some of the things we say. In Isaiah 43 and 24 it says, Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. You see, their reasoning was totally wrong. And can I say, folks, they had perverse thinking. They were thinking was completely wrong. Because if you think evil, by, as far as God is concerned, is going to be looked upon as good, and that good is going to be looked upon as evil, when then your whole moral compass is completely and utterly wrong. And it says here, not only have we wearied God, yet ye say. Here the people are saying, listen, this is what we think. This is what we believe. This is what we feel is happening. And can I say, when your reasoning and your discourse goes that way, I believe you're far away in your thinking from God. And so many times I speak to people and, and, and I, I ask them the question, well, what do you really believe in this situation? What do you believe as far as this is concerned? And moral standards and moral reasoning. And they come out with a load of, 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 of stuff that they believe. And can I say, it's totally against God's reasoning. And it's totally against moral standing. And folks, what you see people today, and the little story that came to my mind was one that Billy told the other, the other Tuesday night in Liz McCarl about the hens bully. Do you remember that one? And you know, there was a, there was a picture come up on the telly of these hens who, who the fox had got in, and the fox had killed the hens, a number of them. And I think I'm right anyway, but you can correct me afterwards anyway, Billy. <clears throat> but I thought it was interesting. But the people's reasoning was they actually put a fence around to protect the hens. But the hens still didn't feel protected. So they had to get somebody in to speak to the hens, to tell the hens that they were all right, and now they were safe because there was an electric fence wire there. Now, I could picture Malcolm Thompson going in to speak to those hens. Malcolm, you had hens, didn't you? Did you ever go out and chat to them? Good man, Malcolm. I'd say they were the only ones who listened to you, but that's good. But you know something? That I just thought of the reasoning. What reasoning do you have of going out and chatting to a hen and telling them, listen, you're going to feel safe? As if they have moral thinking or as if they have a moral compass or if they can even understand. Now, I can understand talking to animals and talking to hens, but don't be expecting an answer because you're never going to get it because it's not reasonable thinking. It's not reasonable thinking. And can I say the... The, the, the thinking here was totally irrational. To think that God is not going to deal with evil. To think that God is not going to deal with what is wrong. To think that you can live your own way in this life and do all the evil you can. And you're never going to have to answer for it before a righteous God. Well, that's exactly what they were thinking here. And it says here, it says here in this little portion, wherein have we wearied him? Do you know everything that God says and everything that God told them to do, you'll notice there was always a wee contradiction. They always says, well, where have we wearied you? Where have we doubted your love? Where have we done this? And you know the first thing I always noticed when I was a wee fella, whenever I was wrong, 
I would have always answered back a wee bit. Now, I always got a good smack for it. That's the way it worked in our house. But you never reasoned with fact. You never reasoned with what was actually right. But here they were trying to reason with with what was fact and what was right. You know, they went so far here, if you read down, when ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good. Can you imagine even thinking that? Everyone that doeth evil is good. The Bible says men are lovers of darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And the evil deeds come out in the night rather in than in the daytime. You know, folks, they went a step further. Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. When the Lord looks upon evil, evil is evil, and God will judge it. There in, in, in Genesis 18 and 25, it says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You see, sometimes we look at things and we say, Listen, evil has gone on. God needs to judge them, and he needs to judge them there now. But God doesn't work that way. The Bible is very clear when it says in Hebrews 9 and 27, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and that will happen one day. Everyone will give an account of what they do. But there in Isaiah 55 is these wonderful words, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, saith the Lord. Neither are God's ways our ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Folks, can I say to you this morning, never look upon evil as good. Never do what the people here did. Listen, because they are prospering. Because sometimes when people prosper, we think, well, listen, they're going to, they're prospering, so I might as well do it as well. That's what we're saying. The Christian is to stay away from evil. Stay away from every kind of evil. Have no uh, uh, unction or power or any discernment with evil. Because they are to live pure in this world. But you know, when things go wrong, it's easy for us to look upon the world and say, well, listen, that's the way they do it. I remember when I was a young fella, about 16 or 17, I only had had one limousine cow. That's all I had. And I remember she had a calf. And that calf was dying as quick as I could get it to live. And we tried everything with that calf to get it to live. And and I was, I was quite annoyed, I'll be honest. And I remember going in and sitting down in the straw beside the calf. And I, and, and I cried out to the Lord. And I says, Lord, you know, I says, I only have one calf. I says, that's all I have to my name. And he's dying as quick as I can look at him. And I says, Lord, look at all the boys around. I said, everything seems to go all right for them. Everything seems to go well for them. And here's my calf dying. And I went out. And I wasn't too impressed at the time, that's to be honest. And I remember my father coming home and he says, do you know that calf's still alive? He says, and I can't understand how. And I'll tell you something better, the calf lived. So I'm some boy, am I? I'm a better than a vet. <clears throat> but you know, when that thinking comes in, we need to be very, very careful. Because God will deal with everything in his own way. You see, the evil man may think he's prospering. But it's only the the, the man who is for God and for good will prosper. Not only in this world. We mightn't have everything that everyone else has. But God has blessed us with spiritual blessings that can never add up. That can never add up. And God has blessed us with a blessing one day because he's gone to prepare a place for us. And that's far, far better. The moral standard. Move move on quickly, folks. There was a depleted storehouse. There in chapter 3 and verse 8. And folks, really, we need to read from verse 8 down through to verse 12. And it says, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? That's the question asked. Yet ye have robbed me. When ye say, wherein, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. And can I say the full picture here is, is three different ways that we rob God. 
And can I say, I don't like talking about finances, and I very seldom ever do. But, but we rob God in not giving our tithe to God. What we are supposed to give to God. And folks, the upkeep of the work of God and the witness of God is important in this world. And folks, can I say, it's given by God's people to uphold the work of God. Now we could go into a tithe and we could say, listen, that's a tenth of our giving and all that says here. And I'm not going to go into that this morning. But what I'm saying to you, the question is, are we robbing God or are we giving faithfully to the work of God? You see, if you go into Corinthians, and I believe Corinthians is, is very important for, for the open, for the church today. It says in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Lay in store. And folks, give to the work of God. And I was taught when I was very, very young to give to God's work. And it's something that I've continued to do throughout life. And can I say to you, and folks, God is not a beggar. Or God, doesn't, God doesn't need, but that is God's principle in giving. Many people today call it grace giving. But I, I love the little portion there in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. It says this, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give. And here's the little thought, not grudgingly, nor out of necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver. You see, when we give to the work of God, we give because of what God has given to us. God has put his wonderful grace in our hearts. God has saved us. And folks, we're giving back to God that which he has first given to us. So folks, let's not rob God. Let's be faithful in our giving. Can I say not only they were robbing God in verses 7 and 8, but they were robbing themselves in verses 9 to 11. There in verses 9 to 11, read down through them, it says, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. See, what God is saying here, he said, listen, you're not to rob me, because in robbing me, you're robbing yourselves. What does God want to do? God wants to pour out a blessing upon us each and every one of us. And God wants to pour out a blessing upon our fellowship and upon his work. And folks, as we give towards the Lord's work, God blesses us. Now, I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel here. I'm not talking about anything like that. But I'm talking about giving from the heart. And God blesses us in that. I remember a wee man by the name of Mr. Wilson, and he left a great impact upon my life as, as a young person. And I remember sitting and listening to him one night, and, and, and uh, he said that himself and Mrs. Wilson were working as missionaries in Japan with, with WEC. And as they were working there, he said, it came to the end of the week, and they, he said they had absolutely nothing. And he said they never got a letter, they never got post, and he said the postman landed up at the door with, with, with a wee envelope. And he said he opened up and there was a lovely wee letter from a little woman uh, there in, in England. And he said when he opened it up, he said there was 10 pound inside. And Mrs. Wilson turned to him and she says, boys, I'm, I'm delighted because the babies, need, we need nappies, we need food, we, we need, and she had a list of stuff. Mr. Wilson said, you know, he says, I'm going in to pray about this here now. Before we do anything with it, he says, I'm going in to pray about it. And he went into his room and he, he sat down and he prayed about it. And he said, the Lord told him to give it to another missionary. Now he says, how am I going to tell the wife? So he went back out and he said to the wife, he says, you know, the Lord has told me to give this to another missionary. And he didn't tell us what words were had in the house. We didn't need to know. But he said he put it into an envelope and he took it to church on the Sunday morning. And he turned to the other missionary and he said, this is for you, the Lord has told me to give it to you. 
And he said, I needed it myself. I needed it myself. And after he'd given him the money, he said he stood back and he was about to walk away. Another man smiled and he took an envelope out of his pocket and he said, the Lord has told me to give this to you. When he went home and he opened up the envelope, how much was in the envelope? 10 Roy, you can't be too greedy. You can only go back what he gave. There was 10 pound in it, Roy was looking for more. But you know what? I thought it left an impact and I've never forgot that. Because them that honor me, I will honor. Isn't that right? And you know, he was blessed himself. And in many times over the years, God has blessed me in so many different ways. You know, and that is a blessing to others. You know, I remember somebody landed up at my door when I was to have the operation. And I, can I say this morning, it was going to cost 25000 for the operation. And the person said to me, Mervyn, if you want that money, you can have it. We'll get it. And I said, well, thank you so much. But I says, we'll just, we'll just leave it with the Lord. But you see the reality, folks, God undertakes, doesn't he? God undertakes. And folks, we never need to rob God of anything. The last little thought here, they were robbing others. You see, as God blesses us and prospers us, that's a tremendous witness to others, isn't it? And others see and others know, and we can glorify God in the midst of us. Let's not rob God. Let's not rob ourselves. Let's not rob others as we give. And folks, can I say, I'm not only talking about tithe here, I'm talking about our time and I'm talking about our talents to the work of God. We give and we bring it into God's storehouse that God's storehouse may be full. Folks, can I just finish with this because I know my time is gone, but I just want to finish with this very quickly because I believe if we allow God to take us, we'll know the blessing in our own hearts and in our own lives. And I want you to look up a couple of verses with me in closing this morning. Turn back to the Psalms. And I preached the sermon there a little while ago. I preached on the first three, three things. But as far as I know, there are seven here in the Psalms. In Psalm 32, 1 and 2, it says, it shows us there how we are blessed. You know, how God has blessed us. First of all, we're blessedly saved. Isn't it wonderful to be saved this morning? and to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. It says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Our sin's forgiven. Our sin is covered. It's not going to be put it against us again. It's paid, and it's paid in full. That helps us to give, doesn't it? When we know we're saved. And we know the Lord. We're blessedly separated. Go back to Psalm 1. And it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands not in the way of sinners, sits not in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in certain ways. He doesn't walk in the ways of the world, but he walks according to the word of God. He's separated from the world, but he's separated unto God. Blessedly satisfied. Psalm 34, folks. Psalm 34 and verses 8 and 9. And it says there in verses 8 and 9, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. But isn't it wonderfully to be satisfied? O taste and see. And when you taste the Lord for yourself, when you get to know him personally in your own heart and in your own life, folks, you'll know what it is to be satisfied. Wonder this morning are you blessedly satisfied? Blessedly strengthened if you turn over to Psalm 84. Psalm 84 says this. Psalm 84 and verses 5 to 8. And we'll just read the first five. It says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart there are the ways of them. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. Isn't it wonderful to know we can be strengthened in these days? 
You know, God longs to strengthen us. You know, no matter what we're going through, God will strengthen us and enable us to get through it. Because he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Psalm 65. Psalm 65. We have a lovely little thought there in Psalm 65. And verse 4. And this is what it says. Blessed is the man whom the Lord chooses and causes to, re and causes to reproach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We, may be, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple, that we may dwell in thy courts. Sanctified means set apart for God. That's what it is. And it's wonderful when God sets us apart for his service, for his work, and for his will. Blessedly subdued there in Psalm 94, and Psalm 94, verses 12 and 13, Psalm 94, verses 12 and 13, it says, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of his law, that thou mayest give him rest for the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. Blessed is the man whom the Lord chastens. Sometimes, folks, can I say the Lord has to chasten us. He subdues us. You know, the children of Israel, I believe, here, we're looking completely wrong at things. And the Lord had to deal with them. And sometimes we in our own mind, in our own will, and in our own situation, we, we think that we're right. And the Lord has to deal with us. And the Lord has to subdue us. And here as he says here, blessed is the man whom the Lord chasteneth. Sometimes he has to chasten. The last little thing here with this I do finish. It said, blessedly softened. Psalm 112 Verses 1 to 9. And folks, we won't take time to read all the verses. Psalm 112, verses 1 to 9. And it says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and delighted greatly in his commandments. We'll only read that one verse. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. You know, the Lord comes in, and if we have that righteous fear, and if we have that reverent fear of God, God has softened our hearts. And God has put us on the right road. And God has put us on the road that leads to heaven and leads to home. And he'll work in us and he'll work through us. Amen.
Please.